do is call you to come back up. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then God on When in the Jordan River you were baptized, O oh Lord, the worship of the Trinity was revealed. For the voice of the Father for witness to you, naming you a beloved Son, and the Spirit in the form of a dove comes from the certainty of that word. O oh Christ, our God who is with you, your Son, glory to when you were baptized in the Jordan, O Christ, O God, the worship of the Trinity was made manifest. For the voice of the Father bore witness to you, naming you his beloved Son, and the Spirit in the form of a dove confirmed the certainty of that word. O Christ, our God, who did reveal yourself, glory to you. When in the Jordan River you were baptized, O Lord, the worship of the Trinity was made manifest. For the voice of the Father born Church of people who study the scriptures, people who study melodies, people who study just the choreography. Uh, there are people who study just the Kedase. There are people who study just the New Testament in depth, just the Old Testament in depth. And usually this is done by what are called Deptaran. Now none of us here are Deptaran. So as Diakon Alamayo said to us yesterday, we need your grace to work with us as we develop this. But to the best of our abilities, we're gonna to present to you the wadam that was done this morning. If you have the, the, the piece of paper, it should be the first item on the, uh, on the agenda, if it's on your seat. Uh, the words are truly, verily. Everybody say truly, verily. That was very weak. Truly, verily. Truly, verily. So every time in the Bible, Jesus is about to say something serious. He's, depending on your translation of the Bible, he says, verily, verily, I say unto you. Or truly, truly, I say unto you. So that's your key to pay attention to the words that are coming next. The next part of the words are mind-boggling is his baptism. There are a number of translations we could have used here. A lot of similar words are sublime, marvelous, wonderful, wondrous, just anything that's beyond our imagination. It's beyond our imagination that John the Baptist would be the one to baptize God. If anything, if you recall the event, John the Baptist wanted God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, to baptize him. And yet, in his extreme humbleness, he permitted somebody else to baptize him. And so in honor of that and in honor of today, Tim Kat, we're doing this what up? Do you have another one?
essay begins, you have the wada that you just saw, that wonderful music. After the wada, you enter what's called alota kidan. Those of you who were here yesterday saw what alota kidan was like. It is the prayer of the covenant. This is part of kiddase, but it's different because there's no kurban. There's no communion being served today. So you're getting a part of kiddase without the kurban. So it makes it a non-Eucharistic or kurban yere lo kiddase. So y'all are going to get a little taste of it. Everybody stand on up. We have our priest, we have our deacon, and we have our audience. Everybody look at the paper in front of you. Get the paper again. The lyrics to Salota Kidan are here. You can take that with you and use it to pray every day. It's a great way to balance your day. And now you'll hear it in the tones of our church. Those of you who have never heard the tones of our church in English are in for a treat. Father, 
Father, Savior of our soul, the foundation of wisdom, keeper of our hearts. You have granted light to our inward eyes and covered us with your knowledge against the darkness of our mind. You saved the first man who was given to destruction by the cross of your only begotten and removed him by immortal things and iniquities vanished through your commandment. And you made redemption through the death of your Son and searched for the lost one for this reason. We, your servants, glorify you, O Lord. always glorify unceasingly and without rest. From the Lord's praise, singing with the praise of glory and thanksgiving. O Lord, you have sent your counsel, word, wisdom, and visitation. It was not created. It was with you before the world began without being created. That is the word who was not created. We appear to the flesh for the salvation of humankind, your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus. Has set us free from the bondage of sin for the reason we are certain to praise you, O Lord. accepted the persecuted and helped them. You saved those in difficulty. You remembered the hungry and retaliated for those who were or sinned against. You are the friend of the faithful, the speaker to the righteous, the dwelling place for the pure. You hear those who call upon you in righteousness, protects the widow, saves the orphan, grants right leadership to the church, which you have made a dwelling place for the glorious faith, the counsel of the spirit, the gift of grace and power. While we praise you without rest, we, who, we know in our hearts your kingdom which was declared unto us by you and your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus, through whom be glory and dominion to you, world without end. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be our name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yours is the kingdom of power and glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, Lady Mary, through the angel Gabriel's greeting, peace be to you. You are pure in spirit as well as in flesh. For the love of the Almighty be the unto you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Pray and pray for us before the Lord Jesus Christ. He may forgive us our sins. say before the gospel is read we always chant in the psalms so you'll see the psalms that we're going to chant there and uh, if you've ever seen the movie Shrek raise your hand this may seem like a very obtuse question but it'll make sense if you've seen that movie there's a part where Shrek says that ogres are like onions in that they have layers the holy scriptures have way more layers than ogres and way more layers than onions. And so when we read the scriptures, we have to know that there are surface level meanings and then there are meanings that are deeper. A lot of the times there are Older Testament meanings and then there's the key to the Older Testament, which is the New Testament, that gives you kind of new ideas. Somebody read, what is the first, what is the first line of it say? We went through fire and water. We went through fire and water. Now, literally, there are instances, like when the three youths are burning in the fire, and St. Gabriel is sent by God to, to save them from the fire. There are literal instances where people are in fire, right? And then there are literal instances where they, they go through water, when the Israelites are traveling through, led by Moses, crossing the Red Sea. 
There are literal moments right there. But there are also times in our lives when we face turmoil, when we face anguish. And that could look differently. It doesn't necessarily have to be a literal fire or literal water that you go through. But everybody goes through hard times. And so that, that's a little bit of, to show you some of the layers of that first line. What does the second line say? Yet you have brought us out to a spacious place. Yet you have brought us out to a spacious place. You know, you can be brought to a new land, a promised land. Or you can be at Tunkat, which is a very spacious place if you see the, the parking lot. But if, when you really think about uh, God, what he always reminds us of, one of the weightier matters of the law, is his mercy. And his mercy is a very spacious place. Other translations say a place of abundance. His forgiveness is very, very powerful. There is a psalm, I believe it's 135 in our counting, that says, and depending on your translation, it says, the mercy of the Lord endures forever. It says it many times. Or it says, the loving kindness of the Lord is everlasting. Some versions even say the steadfast love. Either way, it's the same idea that God's love for you, His mercy, the amount of second chances that He gives you, there are a lot of those. What's the last line say? I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. The Older Testament meaning to this is for the forgiveness of sins. They had to get a bug, a little sheep, and they had to slaughter the sheep and give actual burnt offerings before God. There are other animals they use for animal sacrifice as well, right? But what you can bring to God in response to that, the burnt offering, the sacrifice you can bring Him, is to respond to His mercy, to His steadfast love, and to His, light, lo to his love and kindness, which is everlasting, which endures forever, by treating each person that you find with the same mercy that God has treated you with. If we had done that, we would have converted the whole world to Christianity by now. So while you're keeping that in mind, listen to the tones and really appreciate what Diakon Alamayo is going to do for us now. We went through
So Zamari Zerfe sang for us earlier in the larger tent in English. And uh, God willing, we'll be getting her after after I teach. We're going to be getting her to do the same thing. Uh, she'll be she'll be singing in English for you, just to show that we can praise God in multiple languages while maintaining the melodies that we're accustomed to, and to show you that there's progress, and so that you can help us in our devotion. Um, I said this last night. I'm going to say it again, and hopefully those of you will under will understand it. Will understand it. But the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So I need each one of you to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he sends more laborers. And so that we can do more of these events and make sure that we are going to have someone to take over these buildings that everybody's working hard to get. Uh, now, we typically have a long, drawn-out ceremony for the gospel reading as well. We're not, we're not going to get into that. but. Everything that I teach you about is basically going to be from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. So I'm going to read it for you here. We have it here. Um, yeah, you can, you can hold, you can hold the, the slideshow. I'm just going to read because it, it might be hard for you to click as, the, as I'm reading it. But I'll use the slideshow for, uh, for when I'm going through the verses individually so that we can, so that we can look at it. So uh, I'm going to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. There are many versions of the Bible. There's no perfect orthodox one. This is just the NRSV. I don't know if you guys happen to have one. I'm going to read it. Uh, it's important that we don't just read the Word of God, but sometimes that we just listen to it. Because sometimes we rush to the social media and get one quote here and there, and we miss the entire context. So it's very key for us to get the context and nuance of the Holy Scriptures and try to get it in its entirety. So I'm going to read it to you. Uh, you can read along if you'd like to, but it may be better for experience just to listen very closely. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward for you from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, 
How great is the darkness! No one can serve two masters, for a bond servant will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and Mammon. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. I hope you stayed with me that whole time. Uh, that was a bit long. Indeed, hallelujah. Um, <laughs> there is a lot to be said about that. And we're going to go through each one of those and figure out what exactly that they mean. There's, there are a lot of words that we learn when we take biology class. There are a lot of words we learn when we take Spanish class. There are a lot of words we learn when we take French and history and a lot of other disciplines. And we don't complain when we learn specific terms for those disciplines. But for some reason, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to church, and there's a big funny word there, and especially in biblical scholarship, we don't want to pay attention. We don't want to make an effort to learn those words. And so I just want to point out that contradiction to you all so that we can all open our hearts to learning words in regards to the scripture. I can tell you when I first was introduced to the English Kandase, I speak English pretty well, and I, there were a bunch of words that I never heard of before. But I made an effort to go look them up in a dictionary, look at other sources, and try to figure out what they mean, to see what God is trying to tell me through his servants. So one word I'm going to give you is exegesis. Everybody say exegesis. It, it doesn't have Jesus in it, but it's, it sounds similar to it. Exegesis. So exegesis is about digging. It's about the process of digging into something and drawing out the meaning. When we read the Bible, it's very important that we don't put our own thoughts, our own perspectives, our own outlooks. It's very difficult because we all have perspectives, outlooks, ways we were raised, things we were taught, traditions, teachings, and even viewpoints. Uh, different things that we study, different areas that we grow up, different socioeconomic statuses, uh, different ethnic statuses, any of these things can affect the way that we look at the, the Holy Scriptures. Uh, but one thing we have to do is, as much as possible, pray to God that you're able to draw the meaning, you're allowed to exegete the meaning from the Scriptures instead of throwing it on. Um, <clears throat> before we go into the verse by verse, uh, the title of what I'm doing, if you've seen the flyers and if you've seen the sign, is the Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Prayer in Your Life. And so, I can't tell you that I'm going to teach you about Orthodox Prayer in your life if I don't define some basic terms. If you don't know what Orthodox is, and if you don't know what prayer is, I can't really tell you how to have Orthodox Prayer in your life. So I'm going to briefly define what Orthodox is, and what it means to have prayer. <laughs> if any of you know, if any of you come to Dingle Mariam, you know my uncle Hannibal. He's always taking pictures uh, with the camera. And it's it's not an Ethiopian name, so people always get confused. They're like, oh, are you mixed? Or what's up with that name, man? Because the Hannibal they know is from Northern Africa, and he had beef with Rome. 
So that's who he's named after, and that figure is going to be important. Uh, every speech that a man named Cato the Elder gave, he was a Roman senator, and every speech he gave, if he's talking about geography, if he's talking about geology, if he's talking about history, if he's talking about philosophy, if he's talking about economic policy, if he's talking about foreign war, no matter what he did, he always ended a speech this way, to the point where people are like, uh, are, are you okay? He would always say, furthermore, no matter what he said before, no matter what he said, he said, furthermore, Carthage must be destroyed. And people would be like, okay man, I thought we were talking about history. Okay man, I thought we were talking about geology. Okay man, I thought we were talking about math or economic policy. What does that have to do with, what does that have to do with this? And he said, look, 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 I don't care whatever else I talked about. The only important thing is that Carth Carthage must be destroyed. Carthage is the home of Hannibal, by the way. The man who rode around on elephants to fight Rome. So he's always, Cato the Elder is always hating on, uh, he's always hating on Carthage. He's always saying, therefore Carthage must be destroyed. Furthermore, Carthage must be destroyed. There's one thing that you should always know when we're studying the scriptures. The entirety of the Bible, if you recall the Old Testament, everyone says, oh, Ten Commandments, that's great. You know Exodus chapter 20, you find the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 5, you can find the Ten Commandments. That's great. But if you keep reading after chapter 5 in Deuteronomy, you see there are over 600 laws. And all of those 600 laws are explaining the Ten Commandments. Their expansions, their specifications, their rules, to which none of the prophets, none of the righteous, none of our fathers were able to keep. So Christ, in the New Testament, He gave us... I, it really, it's mind-boggling to use the term of the what from earlier. How He was able to use, He said, you know what? I've just got two things for you. So I need everybody... <laughs> what is it called in English? I, I was about to say it in Amarinya, but it's called making the sign of the cross. Everybody, get your cross like this. You get your cross ready, you put your finger here in the middle. Everyone's got their cross, right? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God. Amen. When we do that, it's not something mindless that we're doing. It's very similar to what Abba Thomas taught us yesterday. Abba Thomas taught us yesterday that we have to use all of our energy to love God. He's told us about love. And the Akun Alamayo yesterday was talking to us about the captivating love that we should have for our God. And love are the two... <laughs> it's okay. We don't deny the kids to the kingdom. For it's theirs. Uh, so love is what we can use to bind all the 600 plus laws. If we forget all the 600, if we forget the 10, we can always remember that love is what gets them together. So the orthodox way of prayer, if you're gonna have to know about that, you're gonna have to recall that as if, if you get nothing from what I say today, just say, furthermore, we must love each other. Everybody say, furthermore, we must love each other. I was very weak, just like earlier. I've got a dying voice right now, and I'm saying it better than you. Furthermore, we must love each other. Furthermore, we must love each other. One more time, blow my ears out. Furthermore, we must love each other. Furthermore, we must love each other. So if you get nothing else from what I said, I, I just want you to take that away from this. And as we make the sign of the cross, what we're learning is about our two, our two relationships. We have a vertical relationship and we have a horizontal relationship. And they're both love relationships. Our vertical relationship is with God. It's us and Him, Him and us. And so you must know to love God with all that you can do. As Abba Thomas said yesterday, when he does with little kids, if you guys were a little bit littler, I would say everybody put your hands on your head like Abba Thomas said. So you have to love with all of your mind. And then everybody put it on their hearts. You have to love with all of your heart. And then shoulders are usually, you say, lean on me, right, for your shoulders. So the shoulders are with all of your strength or all of your power, all of your effort, all of your energy, whichever way you'd like to phrase it. So we have the vertical relationship, right, with God. We have to love God. Then we have the horizontal relationship. Watch, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We have the horizontal relationship. That means we have to love each other. Furthermore, we must love each other. So if you take nothing away from what I've said, you're going to love God and you're going to love each other, and that will be probably better than anything I say to you. 
Okay, now we're going to define some uh, some terms. <laughs> I did have one note here actually. When reading the scriptures, if you get if you get discouraged, everyone says I want to start off in Genesis or I want to start in Matthew and just read everything. If you get in, if you get discouraged, my suggestion to you: pick one book, uh, one letter, one book. Whether they be the Psalms, whether it be uh, any of the other wisdom books, Ecclesiastes, whether it be the letters of Paul, the letters of John, one of the Gospels, and read it all. Then read it again. Then read it again. Read it again and again and again and again and again. Just keep reading that one portion. Eventually, if you're praying with God for Him to reveal it to you, and if you're looking to see what the fathers of the church have said, you'll probably end up knowing that book or that epistle better than anyone else and you'll become the master of that book. Slowly throughout your life, if you keep doing that with different books, you become the master of each letter. If you give yourself time, like I'm gonna read this every day for a week, or I'm gonna read it every day for a month, you're gonna, be, you're gonna know that better than all of your friends, better than everyone else. And that's not for glory, right? You're not trying to say, I know it better than you, but so that God can grant you life, if you just know one section of the Bible better than everyone else, you'll start to see those two commands that we're talking about, loving God and loving each other, Every single verse is about that. You cannot find me a verse in the Bible that is not about loving God or loving each other. Every single thing gets back to that. So you know the main concepts. You already keep that in your head. You do the sign of the cross and you know you need to love God and love each other. And you use that as a key to understand the whole Bible. So now we'll define some terms. I'll tell you as I was, as I was presenting, I try to bring as much English as possible. We've been listening to a lot of Gehiz and we've been listening to a lot of Amarinya. But, <laughs> Afomia pushes me a little bit and she says we, we should get some Gehiz in there. Maybe a little bit of Amarinya. And so, I thought, okay, maybe we'll do just a little bit. So we're going to define what Orthodox means, right? And for us to define that, we're going to look to see what the scriptures have to say about Orthodoxy. The very first psalm that David, or Dawit, uh, says for us begins with the the isi, which means blessed is the man, happy is the man, God pleasing is the man, depending on your translation. The Giddes is closer to just blessed is the man. Then it talks about not having the counsel of the wicked. The next line after that, Zarikoma Wustafanota Hata. Blessed is the man who does not stand in the road of sinners. What's important for us there is the word finot. It means road. And it's, it's something very critical for us to understand. Because in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6, we find Christ saying something about himself. He says, Ana I am the road to righteousness and life or other translations say I am the way and the truth and the life that might be the way you're more familiar but a more literal translation of the Giz it's using the same word finot or road so we have two roads that we see in the first psalm we see finotahatan finotahatan is the road of sinners and you're told not to stand in that road and that blessed man, if you want the deeper meaning, like we say, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because he's the only one who doesn't do that. We all sin. So we're all standing in the road of sinners at one point. He does not. So you have the road of sinners, and then you have what Jesus says he is. The road to righteousness. The word orthodoxy means that. It means the road to righteousness. The right way. The correct path. The true religion. There are many ways that you can say it and translate it. You know, the real original word is Greek, so when you when you start translating things versus transliterating them, just saying orthodox or orthodox, you lose some of the meaning. But when you get the deeper meaning behind it, you have the road to righteousness and the road of sinners, right? So we want to get away from the road to sinners and get on the road to righteousness. So if I'm talking to you today, the title of what I'm saying is the orthodox way, uh, the orthodox prayer in your life. We have to know what orthodox means <laughs> and we have to know what prayer means. So now we know what orthodox means. Orthodox is the road to righteousness, which is the personhood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself. Because he said basically another way of saying what he said is saying, 
I am orthodox or I am orthodoxy. So as if we get to learn how he lived, then we get to learn what orthodoxy is like. Uh, prayer. Prayer has many forms, and we actually got you through them. Uh, the three forms of prayer are formal praying, informal praying, and singing. Everybody likes to sing. Everybody likes to sing. Singing is a form of prayer. Whether it's a spiritual song or not, it's a form of prayer. It just depends who you're praying to. Um, but when we sing, it's our form of worship. It's our form of praise. And when we do that, it's a style of praying that we did earlier, the what up, that you all liked. Truly, verily, truly, verily, uh -huh, mind-boggling is his baptism. That, that we sung, that's a form of prayer. Even though it's a song, it's a form of prayer. Then you have the informal prayer. I'll tell you a little bit about my, my great-grandmother lived to 120, so she has a lot of, she had a lot of stories about her. One story about her is that she didn't really do formal prayers unless she's with other people. And my aunt, when she was with her, would tell me stories that she would just be like, look God, I, I really want to just praise you. I just want to do this with you. I, can you get this done for me? Thank you. All right, I'll wait for you. She is very conversational. And at times, we need to be conversational in our prayers. At times, we need to sing with our prayers. When we get into problems, is when someone tells you, no, you can only sing, or no, you can only have uh, informal prayers. Then we have the final form, the Our Father prayer that everybody say, Abba Tachin Hoi, or Our Father who is in heaven. That's a very formal prayer, it's set out. The Kidan that Abba Thomas and Diakon Adamayo did for us, that's a very formal prayer, it's written down. So, in our lives, we need formal prayers, we need informal prayers, and we need to sing prayers. We need all form of prayers. We need help, we're sinners. So if you wanna get away from standing in the road of sinners, into the road of righteousness, into orthodoxy, and start praying in an orthodox fashion, then we need to sing to the Lord, we need to talk to Him like He's our friend, and we need to talk to Him like He's our Master and our God. We need we need the loose and, and the strict. We need the singing and the non-singing. We need all the type of prayer that we can get. Now we'll go through the verses. That we did. Can you help me with the slash? Oh, yeah. Press the next one. Okay. So we're going to go through all of them, but when it comes to our Father, I'm going to break it up, I'm going to skip it, and we'll, we'll go back and forth, so you'll help me on the slideshow. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward, but when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. If you feel assaulted by how many times you've heard the words of God already, that's a good thing. All of my sermons, in my own personal pedagogical style, is to try and get you to read the scriptures because I don't think people read them enough. So I'm going to try to get you to do it here in the short amount of time that we have. So uh, this is about <laughs> this is about praying in secret, right? There are a number of these verses. We have praying, we have almsgiving, and we have fasting. When we go through them, all three are forms of prayer. And we'll go through them and, and find the other verses. When we find the other verses, we'll go back and explain it to them, right? But so, it's talking about not, not praying in public. Clearly we pray in public, right? So it's not saying you never need to pray in public. But if all you do is pray in public and you're neglecting your private prayer life, then God is going to be looking at you as an empty shell, as a whitewashed tomb, to use the more biblical language. And we're not going to be able to have a close, loving relationship, as we said in the beginning, if we're not doing what we do in public, in private. At the very minimum, as often as you pray with other people, you should pray in your life. If you want to be serious about getting your orthodox prayer life, though, you should pray more by yourself than you are doing in other people. If you go to church a lot, that means now you've raised your burden of how much you need to be praying in your own life. Can you go to the next one? you pray do not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others truly I tell you they have received their reward 
But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not keep up. So this, the top part is what we were just talking about as well, to further explain. When you are praying, do not keep up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask it. When we say Abba Tachin Hoi, as often as we do, one of the things that I fear is that we're losing the value of the prayer. Because to me, I think it's one of the most beautiful prayers that we have, if not the most beautiful prayer. And so what I really encourage you to do is at least in your private life, slow it down. I saw Abba Marcos pop in his head here earlier. If you see him, he's wearing all yellow. What I love about him, when he reads the word of God, when he does kedase, when he prays, he does it so slowly that you have to meditate on each and every syllable and word. So you end up thinking about what you're saying. So we don't want it to be, uh, we don't want the prayers that we're saying to be mumbles, right? We want to mean every single word that we say. So just pay attention to every word that you say when you are praying. So like I said, fasting, praying, and almsgiving are related to each other, so we're going to connect them like I said. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is a very key passage that we have trouble with. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church has more fasting days than non-fasting days. Um, a lot of people don't know that. And fasting means even married couples are not allowed to have intercourse. That means uh, from 12 midnight to 3 p.m., no food, no drink. Some people have, I don't even know if this is true, some people have even said, don't, don't swallow your spit. I don't even know the full extent. I don't know, that one I don't know. The other ones I do know. And then after that, you're vegan. So it's not like you feast after that, like in Ramadan. You have to be vegan after that. So it's a very serious thing that we do. And it's a great way to discipline ourselves. The way that we're always standing in church, when we hear the gospel, even when we hear the readings. I almost wanted to make you stand, but y'all been standing a lot. When we hear the readings, we have to hear them standing. If we're sitting, we're gonna sleep. Very few people, some people do sleep while standing, but very few people sleep while standing. So one of, the, one of the great things about standing and fasting is that it's a way to discipline yourself. If you can stand during Kedase, if you can bind yourself in fasting, then maybe you'll start reducing your sins. And our whole life, as Abba Thomas often teaches at Dingil Mariam, is the process of being holier, the process of reducing your sins, not by your works, but by the grace of God, by praying, and by submitting to the church, and submitting to God. Uh, a great thing about this is so not only are you supposed to do it when nobody's looking here's a problem we get in, here's a problem that we get into uh, we, we like to run onto social media and we like to do hey look at my missing what look at my shittle look I'm fasting everybody check me out hey yeah I'm doing fasting right now look on Instagram look on vine hey yeah look at me busha shuttle right here I'm fasting that's terrible let me tell you don't do that we don't want to be doing that. When the way the fasting we want to do, we don't want to be seen by people. If people ask you, oh, are you fasting? Don't talk to them. Just change the subject. You don't need to be having conversations about that. God knows you're fasting. He's the one who's supposed to know you're fasting. So fast when nobody's looking. And that fasting will be counted to you as a prayer to God. And during your fasting time, we'll get to alms later. Um, but I'll try, to, I'll try to speed it up. I'll follow me about it. I'm going to go over a little. i got to warn you already. <laughs> Concerning treasures, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we're all, uh, 
we're all something. We're all from LA or from New York or from DC or from Boston or from Addis Ababa or from Gondar or from Makala. We could be from anywhere, right? But uh, the thing that unites us in our God, the thing that unites us in orthodoxy is that we all have a destination we want to go. The destination is the Samayawi Yerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. And if we all want to get to the heavenly Jerusalem, then we can't be repping where we're from to the point where it makes people outside of our circle. We have to be inclusive. The love commandments that we've learned in doing the sign of the cross are about loving people and being inclusive. We need to be allow people to be with us as much as possible because Christ was with those people that, that others uh, did not want to be with. He was with the tax gatherer or the tax collector. He was with the prostitutes who, it's, uh, the Bible is funny and just calls sinners sometimes. Sometimes they have a little yulunta or they, they like to use euphemisms and they don't say exactly what the job is, but, but we know what the job is. So we have to be careful that when we store up our treasures, we're not just doing direct deposits to our bank account at Bank of America or Wells Fargo. When we do our prayers, when we do our fasting, and when we give to the poor, what we're doing is doing a direct deposit to God. We're getting direct deposit to God. Now, He doesn't count that work to a righteousness because only He can make us righteous. And only in believing in Him and staying devoted to that belief do we remain righteous. But He deserves prayer, He deserves almsgiving, and He deserves fasting so we can do it. I'll follow me next slide. The sound eye. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Uh, so one of the things that I struggle with my students when trying to teach them about fasting is they're like, yeah, that's for the case. Yeah, that's for the manoxe. Yeah, that's for the diaconat. Yeah, that's for the adults. They got every excuse in the world. So what I have done of late is try to point them to this verse and realize if the eye is the lamp of your body, fasting is not done only with your mouth. Fasting is also done with your eye. And the way you fast with your eye, fellas, is when you see suspect billboards, look away. When you see scantily dressed women, look away. That counts to you as fasting. So it's not just about shuro and misirwet. But eat your misirwet and your shuro and make sure to keep your eyes away. Because if you eat all the misirwet and shuro in the world, but you're going, ooh, look at that. <laughs> that misirwet and shuro means nothing. Absolutely nothing. So we have to keep ourselves honest because God is going to keep our suffering. God is going to keep ourselves, is going to keep us honest on Judgment Day. To, to take that a little further, fasting is not just about the negation, right, as uh, Abba Thomas was teaching us, but it's about an affirmation as well. So the negation of food and the negation of bad thing is good. That, that, that's good to do but even better you need to supplant those with good things so instead of going ooh look at that get icons look at icons think about Christ think about how he works through his angels think, think about all the saints and righteous people who have come before you think about the entire body of Christendom get holy pictures as much as you can and look at them in this way, music as well. You can fast music. You can say, okay, I suck at the food part. Well, at least let me fast music. Let me at least only listen to Mazmur during this fast. If it's the Nineveh fast or the one about Jonah, it's only three days. Can you go three days? Some people can't go three days without an earphone here, pumping the latest Drake or the latest T-Swift, whatever it is that y'all are listening to. But we have to listen to only Mazmur during that time. You know, uh, it's funny, Kendrick Lamar actually says some prayers in his songs, but nobody quotes that. They quote the other stuff. So as long as you're not quoting the prayers of Kendrick Lamar, the next fast, try fasting music. Try fasting visuals, uh, as well as keeping the food as well. Uh, I skipped the, the, the two masters part, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that uh, at another time. I think a lot of you know about not serving two masters. Uh, <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna go really fast. Uh, I'll only go over like seven minutes. <laughs> uh, 
Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat. Oh, I did debate so I could read quickly. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith, therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Uh, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. If we want to make this process uh, quicker, Alamayo has to stay with us. If somebody can can get Zerfe, I don't know if she's, she's going to be singing, she's not going to do it. Okay, so I'll do the Christmas one again. Alright, so we'll switch up our, our Mazmur pattern because Zerfe is busy there and uh, th that's where she was supposed to be, but you all did get to hear from it a little bit. Um, <laughs> when we get into cars, there's a funny prayer during our Kadasi. I don't know if you guys have ever heard it. And everybody says, Amen. I don't know if they believe what they're saying when they say Amen. But one of the important thoughts of there is, if Christians don't look, we're not going to measure your behavior all the time. But if Christian behavior is no different than the behavior of all of your non-Christian friends, then we're, we're probably going to be judged for it on, ju on Judgment Day. So one of the things that we need to be ready to do is not worry about food, not worry about drinks. The obvious practical way I can tell you this is whenever everybody's going around, I've seen people argue for like 30 minutes, sometimes an hour, about what restaurant you're going to go to. Or if you're at the mall, what shop you're going to go to. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to put others before you. That's the sacrificial love that we're talking about in the horizontal relationship. Oh, you want to go to Chipotle instead of McDonald's? All right, let's do it your way. Let's go to McDonald's. You want to go to Sears instead of, I don't know, clothing stores. Can someone tell me a clothing store? Forever 21, anyone else? Nordstrom's, yeah, I want to go to Forever 21 instead of Nordstrom's. Sure, do it your way. That's an easy way to fulfill this. If you want to love people, let them do it their way on the non-essential stuff. There are immovable values you should have, and those are your orthodox prayer. Don't move on those. But on, on silly things like where to eat, where to drink, uh, things like what clothing should we wear, what brand should we have, do we need to get the next Jordans, do we need to get the next Michael Kors, let's not make fun of each other for these little things. I, I've talked about it a lot. <laughs> I'll give you the very briefest story about Matt Bonner. Raise your hand if you know who Matt Bonner is. Okay, very few people know who it is. <laughs> He's a basketball player, very tall gentleman. He was the only person in the NBA at one time to wear a shoe called New Balance Shoes. If you know anything about New Balance Shoes, you know that particularly in the black community, you will be ridiculed if you wear New Balances while playing basketball. I know because I wore New Balances while playing basketball. <laughs> and one of the things that you can know is that it's not cool to wear New Balance Shoes. Matt Bonner was sponsored by New Balance, and he was ridiculed by everyone, and they got no sales from Matt Bonner. So they ended his contract. They said, you know what, we're not making money off you, Matt Bonner. You're not that great of a basketball player, and you're not really selling shoes for us. So they stopped it. But he did a great thing. Matt Bonner obeyed the gospel. And how did he do that? He had like five extra pairs of New Balance. He said, I don't care if you sponsor me. I'm still wearing New Balance. I don't care what clothing I wear. I'm like the birds. I'm like the grass. So Matt Bonner obeyed the gospel. And we need to all be more like Matt Bonner and not care what, what our clothing brand is, what restaurant we're going to, or anything like that. <laughs> Can you go back to the Our Father? We're gonna we're gonna end this pretty quickly. Okay. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. You're gonna focus on the daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, 
but deliver us from the evil one. We're gonna stop there. One thing I do with my class sometimes when we pray is uh, <laughs> another thing why I tell you to be suspect of the things that you read and all the translations that you see, that you really need to dig out the meaning. The original word here is, is Abba. And if you really wanted to translate the word Abba, it's not Father. Jesus didn't get in trouble because he said Father. Everybody accepted God as Father. Jesus got in trouble because he called him Daddy. So sometimes when we pray this, we say our Daddy in heaven. Because Jesus made him our Daddy. He's Jesus' Daddy and through him, he, we, he became our Daddy. So I, I like to, when I pray this, I like to say our daddy. Can everyone just say our daddy for us? Our daddy. In English, it makes much more sense when we say our daddy, we get a better picture of what it is, how radical the message of the gospel is. We realize, oh man, why were all these people freaking out? Why was the high priest telling them, crucify him? Why did they let a murderer, why did through democratic means, why did they allow a murderer to be freed? instead of Jesus. Why did they crucify him? It's because he dared to call God daddy. Not right now, Michaela. Um, before we get into this, Diakon Alamayo is going to give us a little bit of this to show us to show us how the Zema of this goes. In our church, we, we pray this every time in the Kedase, and so Diakon Alamayo is going to give it to us in the Kedase. The reason I'm asking him to do this is so that the next time you're in Kedase, you're going to focus on the daily bread, and I'm going to tell you the three things, and then I'm done. The three things about what daily bread is, but first, you're going to hear it, so that the next time you're in Kedase, you're going to hear it, and you're going to remember this teaching. Sea, they came across, they were in the desert. Every day, God said, I'm going to give you fresh bread every day. So every day, they had, the, they had from the sky, manna. If any of you have a friend named manna, that was the manna, right? The manna that fell from the heavens. And he came and he had to eat that daily bread. So we're going to get into what that is. You're going to get three meanings. Like I said, the, the scriptures have layers. And so we're going to peel back the layers of what this all means. The first and most basic meaning of this is bread, actual bread. But not just bread, you take it a little further, and it means food. You're in Jeraba, what? Anything that you like to eat, your kifo, your gomen, I don't know, maybe you like burgers and pizza, I don't know what you like to eat, but your, your food, that's the very first layer. That's the very base thing, is that when in our Orthodox prayer life, 
we ask God to grant us food so that we can sustain ourselves and then we bless the food in his name we make all food clean in his name the second meaning we take it a little bit deeper that first was a base meaning then we have a little bit deeper meaning the daily bread is also the word of God that means as often as you are eating you need to be reading or hearing the word of God because the word of God grants life to you so when you read the word of God that is your daily bread that's your sustenance that gives you life that helps you to repent that helps you to turn back to God so the first base meaning is your food the second more spiritual meaning the deeper meaning is the reading and hearing of the Word of God now we have our final meaning our final meaning is gonna take us back to the manna the manna that fell from the heavens in the beginning of Kedasi we call Maryam a golden container or if you know if everybody know what a masob is it looks like a rice hat and it's a little table you sit around it a muscle we call her the muscle that's golden that's filled with manna so the daily bread that was given to the Israelites is the personhood of Jesus Christ who is orthodoxy himself he himself is the manna who descended from the heavens because he was the Word of God who was before all creation he was God himself and he became flesh which we celebrated in Christmas 12 days ago then he was baptized now we're seeing okay he's he's really a person he's getting baptized he's born and everything in all the old religions of the world you have sacrifice where you have virgins thrown into volcanoes or lambs you have lambs given to God you offering the burnt offerings we're talking about in the Mispah that Alamayu chanted for us Christianity is radically different to the point where the early Christians were called cannibals because they said, oh, what are you doing in that tent over there? Oh, we're eating God. What? Communion. The final meaning of daily bread is the Holy Communion. In the Holy Communion, differentiating ourselves from all past religions, instead of sacrificing things for God, where God eats what we give to Him, we eat God. In our church, we believe that the elements, the bread and the wine, are truly transformed. We don't pretend to be daring and bold enough to understand how that works, but we accept this mystery. And so we have to all prepare ourselves with repentance, as Abba Thomas taught us yesterday. We need to get ourselves ready to repent. We need to see our Father confessors. We need to be unashamed to let it all go so that we can receive healing. So to end, our daily bread our daily bread is the basic food that we have reading and listening to the word of God and Kaddus Kurban thank you everybody very incredible this is La Beza from Seattle she actually just learned this on Friday she already knew the giz but she just learned this on Friday so give a round of applause for her for being great enough to sing it enough of my voice. I'm going to hear their voices, but you're going to have to help them, and you're going to stand up for us, and we're going to get you loosened up for all of my youth teaching. Thanks, let's give to the Lord God, and let's give thanks, let us give thanks to the Lord
Hashem Malin, may God make you worthy to hear the melodies of the angels and all of the heavens, all the 24 priests of this land. Yaakov, how about you, everybody? Fast, right? No, sorry, sorry. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Let me read a passage from Scripture for you real quickly. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in Him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or powers. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He Himself is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He might come to have first place in everything. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him God was pleased to reconcile to Himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. This comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. So this year's YAM um, conference was entitled Orthodox Spirituality, The Path to the Knowledge of God. And as I thought about this, I thought maybe you guys should talk amongst yourselves real briefly about who you think God is. So briefly turn to a person next to you, behind you, just for 30 seconds or so, and give one or two words about who you think God is. And then, we'll, and then I'll ask just for a few sentences back. Go right ahead. to maybe a psychologist, and then I ended up somewhere in religion and theology, and that leads to what, being a religionist? All right, it's, it's confusing. I'm still trying to figure it out. But we all know, right, being pre-med is a Habesha thing. You go to school, yeah, of course I'm pre-med, like what else am I gonna do, right? And then it's kind of like a college initiation process. So you, I'm sure you know how my parents were feeling. Like, are you sure you really want to study religion? What? What are we going to go to church? What are we going to do? Right? Many people ask that question. And I'm still trying to figure out. It's always different whenever I'm responding to it. Right? So there's an actual reason why I brought this up. Right? I want to highlight this thing that we call in career 
this thing that we call success, and this thing that we call fulfillment in our lives. Right, and I'm sure you all have your own opinions about careers, majors, fellowships, you know, whether one should take a gap year before medical school, and all these kind of sort of questions. We all have our own opinions about that. And that is because modern common sense tells us that if you just major in this one thing, or if you just get this one degree, mix in a little bit of luck, hard work, that you'll be successful, or you'll get the right career that leads to success, that leads to your own personal fulfillment. And this is why when you go to Barnes & Noble, the most popular books are on personal fulfillment through your career, or something along those lines. And this is especially true for people who are in their 20s. So I'm, now I'm pretty sure that you're confused. This thing says the path to the knowledge of God, and I'm over here talking to you about college. I sound like uh, your guidance counselor or something, right? But there was a reason. The reason I brought career up in relation to God is because I think that there is some kind of link. And I was equally confused. When I started writing this, I don't know how. It just kind of ended up being about associated with careers. I didn't plan this, it just was like, careers, and I think God was trying to show us something, and show me something in particular. All right, so I'm just gonna use our ideas about career as a launching point. So the subtitle for this year's theme of the conference was The Path to the Knowledge of God. It seems like a very simple sentence, the path to the knowledge of God. But what do we mean when we say knowledge? But more importantly, what do we mean when we say the word God? Let me tell you a brief story. The chaplain at Oxford University, has the practice of inviting each and every one of his students or her students to their office. And they have to go, and he's a chaplain, right? He's a religious figure. And he invites them, and a lot of them are atheists. And they're like, man, I don't wanna go talk to you about God. I don't believe in God. And he's just like, just come to me. And so I think the school might have made it a requirement in one of the colleges. But anyways, a lot of the students go to him and they're like, it's cool, I'm just here for out of respect for the chaplain, you know, you seem like a cool guy. Um, but I really don't believe in God. And then he goes, so what God don't you believe in? And they go, well, the God that kills people and hates people and the God that destroys the world. And he goes, oh, I don't believe in that God either. And they get really shocked, like, what, you don't believe in God? So, Cliff, this guy was a Christian, so he believes in a different kind of God. He believes in the God of love. So that's why I say it's really important when we use the word God, what do we mean? And when we use the word knowledge, it's really important to think, what do we mean when we say we have knowledge, right? You guys have all been in school. You turn in a grade, or you turn in a paper, you get a grade, therefore, if you get an A, you have superior knowledge. You get a C, you have average knowledge. If you have an F, you failed, you have no knowledge. And then you apply this logic, right? This is our knowledge, this is like common sense. Okay, so if this is how I get knowledge in school, let me apply this to God. So then we try to accumulate information about God. And that's how we have knowledge, right? I know more things about God, therefore I'm the one who knows God. Is that right? I don't think so. And I can witness to you as a person who's been studying religion, academic religion, in an academic sphere, in a university, studying theology, there are many people who know a lot about God, know a lot of mind-blowing things. Be like, whoa, that's so amazing. But not a lot of people actually know God in the university setting. They know about God, they have mind-blowing facts and information about the Bible. And that's why you have you know, many atheists who study theology and religion. So to accumulate knowledge and facts and information for the Christian does not actually mean knowledge of God. Knowledge of God does not accumulate. It's not something that you can have more or less of, like property. Like you have one house, I have no house, so you have more. Not like that. Because if you start thinking like that, then you get into the problem of how do I measure someone who has more knowledge of God than I do? Right? Then you put those people who are maybe illiterate or who don't have formal education to the side, just like we do in regular society, and you dismiss them. But knowledge of God is not that kind of knowledge that accumulates 
or that you can have more or less of. Knowledge of God is about sustaining communion. Or to put it another way, knowledge of God is simply about being in a relationship with God. It's not about accumulating facts and knowledge and information. And the way that we get this knowledge of God, the way that we enter into this relationship with God, is through prayer. Relationships are established on the principle of there are two people, individuals, and they communicate. But in this case, God and humanity. We enter into this conversation with God through prayer. And this prayer becomes a form of worship. And the word worship means to surrender, to serve, to hold in awe, to prostrate before it. And it is through worship that we claim that we know God, especially for the Orthodox Christians. To know God is to worship God. And as one theologian said, you guys with me? You guys all with me? To know God is to enter into relationship with God. And the way that we enter into relationship with God is through prayer. And prayer is worship. One theologian put this very beautifully. The, the one who prays is a theologian. And a theologian is the one who prays. I, I'm sure you're probably like, what's a theologian and all that? But pretty much in the modern sense, a theologian is someone who just has a PhD in, in theology. Right? But it doesn't really mean anything, like I told you. I've witnessed to it. Many people know stuff about God, but they do not know God. But this theologian says, it's actually the one who prays, like that mother who sits in the corner. The one who simply prays, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. She has no PhD, she doesn't have a bachelor's, but she knows God. But before I move further on how we can actually figure out who this God is, um, sorry, but before I move on about how we actually enter into this relationship, I think it's important that we figure out who this God is. Right? Just like I cannot be friends with you unless I come to really know you, you cannot come to be in a relationship with God unless you actually come to terms with who God is. Do you understand me? If I said that uh, I had a friend and all I knew about that friend was where he went to school and uh, how many siblings he had and some other sparse kind of random facts, that person isn't really my friend, they're just an acquaintance. Right, so just imagine just how much more we must come to terms with who God is if we claim Him as Father, as Redeemer, as Savior. Right, we don't want to be in a fake relationship with God where we know, well, you know, Jesus died on the cross, this, this, and that, and you know all these facts. We want to be in deep relationship. Right, so just to make sure we're all on the same page so far, I said that to know God is not about gathering stuff, but about being in a relationship. And we establish this relationship through prayer. But before we even do that, I think we need to figure out what our God, what God is not. It's easy to say what God is. It's hard to say what God is, but it's easy to say what God is not. And I think the way that we figure out what God is not, or what our modern gods are, is simply by looking around. The things that you surrender your lives to, the things that you surrender your time to, the things that you surrender your whole being to, and your lives are dedicated to it. That is essentially what your God is. And many of us have built up false gods. And I chose for today the false god of careerism. Careerism is our false god. But I could have easily chosen money, power, wealth, idolization of celebrities. It's very easy to choose those things. But I just thought careerism because I don't know, it seems very relevant today. As human beings, we have a natural inclination, a natural impulse that leads us to seek religion or some kind of thing beyond ourselves. One theologian calls this the religious impulse. This impulse leads us to seek things that are beyond ourselves that drive our lives. And since we have this impulse, we're always on a mission to find something to worship as a god. Though there are many gods that we worship for today, I chose careerism, like I've said. But 
If you think about what a career is, it's a fairly new phenomenon. Really new. This hasn't even existed maybe for 100 years or so. And people in the past never really thought about careers. The reason they never thought about careers was because you did a job, you got money, you lived. But the way that they found meaning and identity in their lives was through religion, was through the God that they worshipped. But when the Enlightenment happened in the 17th century, you have people putting religion to the back seat, right? You, put, you have religion starting to go away. And that leads people to start what be uncomfortable. Now they don't know what drives them. They don't know what they're living their lives for. And then you have the Industrial Revolution. People are starting to build things and build them quicker, faster, more efficient. And then you have people moving across the, the globe. You have people crossing oceans. And this leaves a huge gap in society. And it creates this modern phenomenon called the career. And the career now is this thing where you're supposed to establish your identity on, you're supposed to establish your life on, you're supposed to establish your values, and you get meaning and purpose from this career. And that's why you have phrases like, I'm trying to discover myself, or discover the real you. These all point to the fact that careerism has taken a place and a position of religion. Sorry to give you that little history lesson about enlightenment or industrial revolution, but I think it's, again, important to know what we mean when we say career, right? So let me just translate this into four terms and images that you're probably well aware of, of how uh, careerism has become a, sen a kind of like a, a, a demigod. So traditionally, religion provided a sense of stable community, right? There was a church, and that's where you found your, your, your community, possibly. Or if not the church, in your household, around in your village, and those people probably were around the same, uh, same religion as you. But that's not true anymore, clearly, right? We're in one of the most diverse, I mean, we're in the most diverse country, but one of the most diverse cities in the country as well, right? And I can even uh, testify to this myself. Uh, I haven't seen my family, I've seen my family all of, like, 10 days last year, all of last year. That's because I'm in school, I'm in work, right? And we're always busy, and we have no sense of community anymore. But career comes around, and they say, guess what? We're gonna have a, a office party, we're gonna have an office gathering, we're gonna take you on a weekend retreat, and we're gonna, we're gonna be one big family, right? So the career and your office start to take the place of what traditionally was left for religion and community, and right? for the church. Right, and, and corporate America knows that. Many top companies know that you get lonely, so they give you amenities at your job so that you never even have to leave. You have food, you have a gym, you have a shower, why would you even need to leave? And you buy into this economy and you keep working, 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 working. And that's it. And now, your career has given you your community. So you're like, okay, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to see people uh, who have the same faith as me. All right, so that's the first one. The second one, values, rules, and rewards. Generally, these things were preserved for the space of religion. But with the rise of careerism and all the other isms, you see opposing systems of values, right? You don't know who's right. For example, what if God tells you, don't charge interest on the poor? But you're a banker, or you work on Wall Street, or you work for a company that says, not only must you charge interest on the board, but I'm going to give you a 10K bonus if you figure out how to do it more efficiently and get more money with less work. Hmm. Now you have two opposing views. You have the God whom you claim to worship telling you, don't charge interest on the poor, on the poor but your company is telling you, not only do you have to charge interest, but you need to figure out how to do it more efficiently. So then you're, you're stuck in this dilemma, right? So careerism, in the shape of a religion, has its own values, which are make more money, and its rewards are, if you get more money from me, then I'll give you a little bit of my cut. And it has its own rules and functioning systems, right? And the third one is one of the more powerful ones. 
Careerism gives you a real sense of meaning and a purpose, which were generally preserved for the space of religion. No one ever needed to figure out who they were or where they were going to find their meaning. It was just ingrained into the water. But now you go to Barnes and Nobles and you have all these books, find the real you, discover the real you, how to find meaning in your life, and so on and so forth. And a prime example, this is a, just a regular story that you might have lived or you may know someone who is like that. Right? There's a person, they major in finance, they go to Wall Street, and they get tired of that kind of lifestyle where they're always abusing and making more money off the back of the poor. So this person, you know, decides to switch up their career because they want to get more meaning. So they go into nursing, medicine, or some other field where they find fulfillment. And you guys all probably know people like that, or you may be experiencing that yourself. This thing that you do doesn't fulfill you, so you go into another thing that is supposed to lead you to fulfillment, right? So careerism provides a sense of purpose, identity, and meaning. And the last one is might be a bit of a stretch, but I think it works. Immortality. This is the fourth P that I think careerism provides. Immortality, as you probably still think of it, is reserved for the space of God. <clears throat> but let me give you a few phrases that I'm sure you've heard of. How will you impact the world? Or how will you leave your footsteps or your footmark or your footprint on the world? Think about that just real quickly. How will you leave your footprint on the world? And how will you impact the world? It's a lot of pressure, right? How, me, how am I going to make an impact? And I think that this goes into our deeper sense of wanting to be immortal, wanting to live eternally. Right? So if I just work hard enough, and if I just do a whole bunch of stuff with my influence and my power and my money, then maybe people will remember me. Maybe I can build, like, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right? Bill and Melinda Gates are never going to be forgotten now because they have this huge foundation with billions of dollars. The Carnegie Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, these people's legacy has made them immortal. And I think that sometimes careerism, that's what it provides for you. If you just work really hard, guess what? You won't be forgotten. And since we have that religious impulse that makes us not want to, you know, that makes us want to live forever, sometimes we find careerism as the outlet. So when our religious impulse is not formed or guided towards the proper end, it creates false gods. And today's false god that I've been talking about is the god of careerism. But again, I could have done this with money, fame, celebrities, anything really that, you know, that modern phenomenon, that modern culture just places on a high rank. But I just chose careerism because of its relevance. So again, to make sure we're on the same page, I've tried to communicate two broad um, ideas. First, the way we come to know God is through prayer, because knowledge of God is not about accumulating facts, but about relationship. And that second, we must break down our false gods before we can even figure out who the real God is. Right? So before we come to say who God is, we must always say who God is not. That's an easier way to approach it. Right? So, can somebody remind me of some of the things that you guys said God was? It was like a parent, creator, beginning, alpha and omega. Right? These were some of the themes, uh, some of the words that you guys used. Let me tell you another brief study that someone did. A sociologist did a huge survey of American youth, and he asked them a similar question. He said, who is God? What is your relationship with the God that you claim to worship? All these people were Christian, by the way. And he got a lot of interesting responses. One of the responses he got was that God is like a grandpa who just lives in the sky, old man with a beard. Another response that he got was that God is like a angry judge. He just kind of judges everyone. And that their relationship with this God was that simply he gave them what they wanted when they wanted it. And he kind of, you know, was a nice guy who just gave them advice every now and then. So that's like the modern phenomenon. You pull out your iPhone, you know, you're like, I'm feeling down today. Let me, let me get a little good scripture. Let me get some motivation to go. 
right? And you check out your passage, and then you feel good about it, and then you continue on, right? So at the end of his study, he came up with this thing called moral therapeutic deism. It pretty much means a lot of American Christian youth believe in a God who's just a feel-good therapist. He's not even like a therapist who challenges you. He's just a therapist who you just, you know, go to if you want to feel good about yourself, if you want to be validated on, you know, your own decisions. And that's what many of the God, the God that a lot of American youth, and maybe including some of us, believe in. Right, so, it's, so that we don't become like these youth who uh, this sociologist wrote about, let's try to return to scripture and see who this God is. Right, and it's just the scriptural passage that I read for you earlier. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things in heaven and on earth were created. Things visible, invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, powers, all things were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. So this is who God is. God is the creator, the redeemer, and also the sustainer. Or to put it in other words, God is the one who created the world in the beginning. God is the one who saved the world in time through his son, the Lord Jesus. And God is also the one who continues to put up with our madness every day. The God of Genesis is equally the God of the cross who's also equally the God of the manger, who's also equally the God of Pentecost, right? The God of Genesis is the God of the manger, who is also the God of Pentecost, right? In the manger, you guys all know what the manger is, right? Where Jesus was born as an infant. We see exactly who God is. He descends into the place of humanity, into the place of the lowly. He meets us exactly where you and I are, in the flesh. But he didn't come as a king. He came into the world as a poor human being. Pause and think about that. He didn't come into the world as a king, but rather he came in born in a manger where there was not even space for him to be born at least, you know, in a more appropriate place in the inns. He became human, leaving the unending worship of heaven to become mortal. The untouchable became touchable. The invisible, one, the invisible one became visible. The infinite one became finite and confined into the body that you and I also have. Imagine Donald Trump, billionaire, leaving his thrones his penthouses, simply for the sake of love. Might, you know, give one of those buildings away for a tax break, but I don't know about if it's going to be for love. Right? But just imagine how much more, like, times that by infinity, <laughs> times that by uh, many numbers, right? God left the throne of unending worship to be like you and I. So that we can see God face to face. Now I'm using all this kind of fancy language it might sound, but I just really want us to think about it. We were not part of God's original covenant with Israel. We are we were outsiders. We were Gentiles who were called into God's own story, into his covenant, into his promise. And he didn't have to do this, but it was for the sake of love. So how did I find this out? Did I just create this creator, redeemer, sustainer, all this kind of stuff? Did I just find this out? Did I, am I just smarter or something? Probably not. Actually, I, mean, I know I'm not smarter. The reason I know this is because I go to church sometimes. If you go to church sometimes, I promise you, you learn a few things. Even if you don't even listen to the priests or the deacons or anything. But if you just look at the screen, and read the words on the screen, that is who our God is. The worship 
that we did earlier, holy God, holy mighty, holy living immortal, guess what? That is exactly who God is. Right? And then we said that God was born from the Virgin Mary. Have mercy on us. You were baptized in Jordan. And then crucified on the cross. Have mercy on us. You were crucified and then you rose from the dead. Ascended into glory. That is exactly who God is. You don't have to search anywhere. Just go to your worship life, to your prayer life. And you will find out who God is. The technical term for this is Lex Orandi, Lex Credenda, but you probably don't care, that's Latin. But in English, it means the rule, the rule of prayer is the rule of belief. The rule of prayer is the rule of belief. What you pray is what you believe. Just like what you eat is what you are. What we pray is what we are and who God is. And that's how we come to know who God is through our life of worship. And this is why I think liturgical formation or participating in the liturgical life is so critical. Because if you don't know the liturgy or if you've never heard it, and if you don't want to hear it, then you're going to have a hard time figuring out who God is. Let me tell you a brief story from the early church. There was a guy named St. Basil, and uh, there were these people called the Eunomians. So St. Basil was part of the, the mainline church, and he believed in the Trinity, and he believed in the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So all prayers in the early church, and most of our prayers now, end with uh, um, praise to the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. But the Eunomians came around and they said, they just cut out the Holy Spirit. So they said, glory to the Father, in the Son, period. And that created such a controversy, you'd be surprised. And that's why people think it's really important, and that's why we think it's really important to have a proper worship life and a proper worship service. Because if you don't, then you won't know who God is. So we've said that knowing God means to pray to God, and we've said that we must worship the true God as opposed to the false gods that we're usually creating for ourselves. And we've also said that the true God is the one to whom our liturgy is directed, the God revealed in Jesus. But how do we just practically come to know this God then, right? So the final part is just about the word, the path, right? Because the subtitle for this year's theme was the path to the knowledge of God. Knowledge of God is we've already covered, but now let's take up the word path. What does it mean that there's a path to the knowledge of God? Can I not just wake up one day and say, hmm, I know God now? I've prayed 10 times, I know God? Probably not. Right? So there are three main stages to this path. And the way that these stages works, uh, it's not kind of horizontal where you just kind of, you're going to go up and ascend. You might be stuck in a couple of the levels at the same time. Or you might fall from one level and go back to the, to the first one. So the first stage or level is purification which is just a fancy theological dense way of saying to put off the world. In this stage of the journey, a lot of us get stuck. It's really hard to get purified from the world. It's really hard to give up what you care about in the world. And most of us will probably just end up staying here for a long time. Hopefully we find our way out. In this stage of the spiritual life, we're like children. We don't know what's good for us, just as children don't know what's good for them. That's why they always want candy, right? And we're like spiritually young children. We always want the sweet candy. Because it's sweet and tempting. But in the state of purification, we go through the process of repentance and turning away from those things which we know to be inadequate or unfitting for the Christian life. One theologian called this process turning away from your ignorance. Hold that in your head. The process of purification is turning away from your ignorance. What's the ironic thing though? Ignorant people don't know that they're ignorant, right? Seriously, that's the, the, that's the hard part. But once you realize it, then you're just like, oh gosh, I always thought like that for that long? Ugh. Right? And that's, what, that's why this stage is so hard to get out of because we're ignorant, our eyes are closed. We don't see the light that is right ahead of us. <clears throat> 
So this is the hardest hurdle to jump over because our eyes are closed, the world is tempting, and we're ignorant in the spiritual sense. So attaching this back to careerism, because I don't want to leave you with the sense that you're having a career is bad. That's not right. But in a practical sense, in purification, we put off the old. We realize that a career does not define us, explain us, and maybe not even the most important reality in our life. This is not to say, again, that we should not strive for success to become you know, an, an important person, but it is to say that the high school dropout will equally be saved as the person with an MD. Interesting thing, actually, Jesus even says, it is easier for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. I'm not saying don't become rich. Again, I'm not saying do not become rich or don't get an MD. If anything, it's probably unchristlike to use the resources that you have and you know become a fruitful servant. But what I am saying is that this career is simply a job. It has nothing to do with your spiritual life. It does not define your relationship with God. It should not define your relationship with the body of Christ, meaning the church. Although I'm sure we treat our high school dropouts a little bit differently in our communities than we do other professionals. That's something, that's a whole other thing. So in the, spirit, in, the, in the state of purification, we move away from finding our lives centered on our material wealth, on our jobs, and on other people, to focusing on the creator of all. We become purified essentially from our self-centeredness, from our narcissism. Right, so that's the first stage. The second stage is illumination. In this stage, we begin to do works of the Spirit. Once we are purified, we begin to, on the path of illumination. To be illuminated means to see the light, or to see by the light. So in other words, we see the light in the world. The things that were once hidden in darkness are now brightened because of the working of the Spirit in us. And it's very important to realize that you can't do this on your own. You can't get to a state of illumination without the help of the Holy Spirit. It is God working within you constantly, right? Because if you start trying to do it on your own, I promise you, you're not gonna get too far. And then it'll become vain glory. But we're always working for the glory of God. So in this state of transformation, our eyes become bright and we begin to see the light. And we realize that our careers are nothing more than an extension of our lives to bring the kingdom of God to earth. They become a part of us so that we can bring glory to God, not for ourselves. They become a way that we use our talents, where if you are a skilled mathematician, you use your skills in the world to bring glory to God. Don't you guys hate when this happens? This thing freezes a lot, sorry. We extend his kingdom into the world and we begin to invite others into our lives, the stranger. And the important thing to realize in the stage of illumination is that we're gonna fall. We're gonna fall many times. But God is not concerned with how many times you fall, but how many times you get back up. And the third stage is perfection. Now you're probably like, I cannot be perfect. How does, this guy's crazy. How does he expect me to be perfect? Right? And that is, it's hard, right? How can, I, how can anyone expect anyone to be perfect? But Christ says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. But now we need to do a little bit of uh, this is where Greek, knowing Greek, comes in handy. The word perfect in Greek means telos, it's the word telos. The word telos means to be brought to your end. The word telos means to be finished. The word telos means wanting completeness or wholeness. The word telos means full grown and mature. So we have a variety of opportunities or words of translation. So in that sense then, it's a lot easier to understand how we can be perfect. 
Right? Let me read you one passage of scripture that says that will shed light on this. For in for in him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. In him, if you just translate it another way, take complete, because it's the same word tell us. In him you have been made perfect. In who? In Christ. So in Christ we have been made perfected. We have been made whole and complete. And what this simply means is that to be perfect and to be whole and to be complete means to love impartially. To love as God loved. To reflect God's love into the world. It means to be the salt of the world and shine a bright light into the spaces of darkness that the world is. Being perfect is not really about not committing sins, though you should strive for that, but God knows that we always fall. Again, it's about getting back up, but being perfect is about loving impartially, loving as Christ loved. When you live in the world, people should always wonder, why is this person so loving? I always do bad things to them, but why is, why is this person so forgiving? People should really just wonder, hmm, this, this is like, he's weird. People should really think we're weird sometimes, actually. Seriously, if you forgive all the time and you're always willing to do something for someone, they should really go, man, you're weird. Seriously, that, that is how much we should love, to the point where people think that we're foreign. We are foreign. Our citizenship is in heaven while we're dwelling on earth. So this then is a challenge for all of us. Right? This is why it's the last stage. Perfection is extremely hard to attain, to love others as Christ loved. But when we reach this level of completeness, our careers also begin to reflect God's love. We no longer care for the career as an end in and of itself, but rather it becomes a way that we extend God's love into the world. This is regardless of whether you're an accountant, doctor, grocery, clerk, a nurse, whatever, whatever you do for a living. Your career becomes a way that you extend God's love into the world. It's a way that you witness to the world. It's a way that you show the world that there is another way to live your life. And let me tell you how. And this is the thing about the whole three-step process. It's never ending. And you want to know why it's never ending? Because God is unending love. God, in God's own very nature, is infinite. <laughs> so therefore, you can always grow. It's a path. It's a path that leads to infinity. You continue to love more and more. You put off the hatred and you start to love more. You put off the envy and the jealousy and you start to love even more. And you continue to grow on this path. So that's where I want to challenge us all. We can, we're never going to reach that level, so we always need to be able and recognize that we need to learn more and love more. It doesn't stop. Like, yes, I went to Tinka today and I learned this wonderful lesson, and then next week you love, you know, you did a few nice things. It doesn't stop there. It's a constant struggle. It's a constant battle. And you continue to grow in it. So to recap, this is just in conclusion. Knowing God is not about, knowing God is about relationship, through worship and prayer. But in order to know God, we must stop our, fight, our false idolizations of careers and our own glory and replace this with the God with whom we know through our life of prayer. The God who we know that is in our prayers is the God of love. Those prayers and songs and those words in scripture that we read, those are who God is. So to continue to grow and to know God, we must enter into the life of God through His Son, who came into our very nature, in our very midst. So we continue to follow this path and this journey through Christ our Lord. If our idea or if our perception of who God is does not lead us to a God of love, then we have missed the mark somewhere along the journey. If our lives do not reflect the love of God, that means we are still working on the journey. If our interests and our careers do not lead us to love, then we need to put them through that three-stage process. You can do this with anything in your life. Purify it, illuminate it, and then perfect it with anything in your life. 
So to be on the path to God means to be on the path to the fountain of love. And behold, as we go along the journey, we are required to leave pieces of our old self behind. We are called to shed all of that hatred, all of that envy, that greed, the pride at the door. Because in love, there is only patience, kindness, and equality. Our negative ideas about God, our negative ideas about people, our idolization of money and power, and our urge for the consumption of stuff will be cleansed and left at the door. But before we enter into true relationship and knowledge of God, we must recognize that we do not know at this point, and that we must recognize that we are ignorant. That is where we must begin, that we do not know, so that we may grow into this knowledge. In God, we only see one thing, and that was revealed in His Son, and this one thing is that God is love. Glory be to God. I'm 
about I was lost but now I'm found I am redeemed I am saved That's why my words That's why your grace and redeemed by my words that's by your grace why am I Lord you mind me taking away my own sweet this my my own vanity you showed me love by my words that's by your grace I am redeemed I am redeemed I'm saved that's by my words that's by your grace <laughs> So now a brief blessing from Abel Nielsen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Father Thomas, Father Abba Marcos, the Marys of Faith, all of you. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, I'm so happy, I'm so glad to be here to share your program, to share the Word of God with you. I am so happy. So now I would like to say a few words. A few words because I am so happy. Now, I would like to tell you, you know, you are here today in purpose. You are here today because to learn something about your church, about your tradition, about your country, about your family, about the Word of God. So you learn. You learn uh, through Devon Alamayo. This is really, we get a good lesson uh, today. So now, you know, Ethiopian Orthodox Church, especially uh, at this time, our fathers or bishops, uh, priests, we are we are concerned about you we concern about you you know why because we have a church every state today we have a church you know we worship in Amharic we worship God in Amharic language we worship God through uh, our culture so now we are fine. We understand each other. Because we speak our own language, we watch through our culture, that's really wonderful for us. We are comfortable. We are thinking about you. You are not born in Ethiopia. You born in this country. You grow up through this country. So, uh, you, you grow up in this country. So now, now, we are concerned about you because you have to keep this church. We have the next generation, you. You should keep this church. To keep this church, you have to learn like this. You have to learn something. 
You don't have to ask your family. You don't have to ask your priest close to your parish. You learn something. If you are not learning, you are not keeping this church. You are not, you are not understand your culture. You are not understand, you know, to worship the God. This is very important. We are very, very concerned about you, your guys. As I said, we have beautiful buildings every church, every state. We have a church. So who will worship into that church after 20 years? We are not, we are not being here after 20 years, after 40 years. That church is yours. Right? That church is yours. How do you keep that church? If you are learning, if you are not learning today, if you are not understand about your church today, if you are not understand about Bible. So to keep this church, you have to learn like this. Make program. You know, ask questions. Okay, this is our church. This is, we are the next generation. So how we can learn about our religion, about our faith? Ask this question and go to your parish priest. They will ask a question, make a program, learn something. You know, we are, we are, we are with you to help you, to help you, whatever, whatever, whatever it is, we will help you. We are, we will be, we will stand with you. We are ready to teach you. So make a program and uh, learn each other. Ask your family, your family is your teacher. You know, they ask your family about your religion. Don't, when we have time, don't ask to go uh, shopping or more or something, something, uh, something like that. Come to church. You know, come to church. Every Sunday come to church with your fa family. Learn something. We, we should keep this uh, beautiful church. We have beautiful church. That's our identity, okay? That is our identity. If we lose this church, we are losing our identity. Okay? That is my message. I am so glad to be here. Thank you very much. We're going to have a quick discussion session, and then Father Thomas is going to end uh, with prayer. Uh, uh, a round of applause for Aphomia, what to make all this possible. Thank you, Brother Hina. Um, actually, what we're going to do right now is just a uh, recap of what we learned so that we take the fruits of what we learned today with us uh, when we go home. If you pull out these pamphlets, do you have them in black and white in your seats? You could just pull that out. This is this was organized by Andene Kubaye, which is Unity Forum or the Sunday School Unity Forum. Uh, it gathers all of the Sunday schools or the choirs of all the Ethiopian Orthodox churches and our synodos. And we put on events like this amongst other things. Uh, I'm part of that committee and we also co-organized with YIM, which is Young in America Ministry of the Ethiopian Orthodox Father Church. And so we put together this pamphlet for you, and this is one of our services, is to provide everything in English that we can that's in Amharic. So we have Dakona Shanafi Makonen in Ethiopia, who's a very wonderful deacon, who's an author of many beautiful books that have really changed my life. Uh, and we had our brothers Dakon Tariku and Dakon Yenene translate them into English. Um, so if you can open the uh, pamphlet, did everyone, everyone find it? Please hold it up, make sure you have it. Okay, so when you take this whole, the black and white version, you can tell your families you have the Amharic version and then 
the English version is for you, okay? So I want to take, take you to the section that says pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. I'm going to read the third paragraph for you, okay? It says prayer is more like breathing. Just as breathing is pretty essential to our physical well-being, so is prayer to our soul. Breathing is something that provides life and vitality, and without it, we wouldn't live. Prayer is, a natural, is as natural as breathing. You do not have to think to breathe because the atmosphere exerts pressure on your lungs and essentially forces you to breathe. That is why it is more difficult to hold your breath than it is to breathe. Similarly, when we were born into the family of God, we enter into a spiritual atmosphere where God's presence and grace exert pressure on our lives. Prayer is a normal response to that pressure. This is what Paul is getting at when he tells the followers of our Lord Jesus Christ in Thessalonica to pray continually. And you'll find when you go home and you open your Bibles today, I, I want you to open your Bible to uh, Thessalonians chapter... First huh? Thessalonians um, chapter 5. where it says rejoice always pray without ceasing and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you so when when it says rejoice always pray without ceasing let's repeat that pray without ceasing Can you pray? again I can't hear you so I want you to reflect on that if the word of God is telling us to pray without ceasing, what does that mean? When should we pray? Always. Always. Is that good? Always. Always. So, I want you to turn to your neighbor and ask or tell them where you are in your prayer life. Just turn to your neighbor and ask your neighbor or tell your prayer, tell each other where you are in your prayer life.
what you learned today that will help you strengthen your prayer life, even if you don't come up here? Uh, love God and love your neighbor. You learned about loving God and loving your neighbor? How about specifically strengthening our prayer life? Yes, thank you. Can you speak up for me, please? Or come here? Okay, okay. Speak up. Um, pray when no one else is looking. Learn uh, more about praying when no one else is looking. Very good. Thank you. Um, not to be extravagant when you pray. Not to be extravagant when you pray. Very good. To be mindful of what you're praying, no matter what. To meditate. To meditate. Very good. What else? Take out outside distractions. Take out outside distractions. Very good. Anyone else? Understand that when you're fasting, you should also fast spiritually and not do from things spiritually and don't do things that you wouldn't do in front of your parents. Very good. Anyone else? That's it? Alright. Thank you very much. So we'll close this now. Thank you. Okay, I want to thank all of you for staying with us and following us and let us end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. O oh Lord, we thank you for bringing us together today to consider how to build our prayer life. Help us to recognize that we need to take it with us wherever we go. We need to recognize that you have called us together to realize your presence in our midst, and we should take it with us and pray to you wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever we're doing, we need to include prayer with what we're doing. And ultimately, to turn everything that we do into a prayer, glorifying you with every thought, word, and deed, glorifying you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever.